Thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar on sales compensation, everything your company needs to know. My name is Erica Charleston. I'm the content marketing manager at Fullcast, and my goal is to provide resources and education um, to the national sales ops community in an effort to equip everyone uh, to become more informed sales ops and business professionals for the benefit of your company. Fullcast has been doing a ton of outreach through events and content in an effort to build community with, within the industry. And we're currently the leading voice in sales operations education. And um, we, um, we just want to uh, give you guys as much education and best practices for uh, the business development of your company. So I'm joined here by Matt Holler, the founder of The Startup Seller. Matt has a deep understanding of sales operations, and um, he is from the startup seller, and he has a long history of designing sales incentives programs for companies of all sizes. So this webinar will take more than 40 minutes, but we will have some time at the end to answer questions. So if you see on your screen, there's um, a Q&A button, so feel free to chime in at the end. I did receive a number of emailed questions from some of our registrants, and I'll be sure to have Matt answer them as well. Without further ado, I'll pass this on to Matt Holler. Matt? Thank, thanks, Erica. Like, like Erica mentioned, um, I am the founder of The Startup Seller, which is a boutique sales communications and consulting agency. And we work with companies across uh, various sizes on uh, elements of their go-to-market strategy, uh, as simple as you know, what customers are we going after, how do we organize our, our resources, making investments we need to drive, to drive growth, and then ensure that our compensation programs are really communicated to our, to our reps in a way that they understand. And, and like, she, like she mentioned, today's webinar will be about sales compensation fundamentals and all of the components that, that companies need to get right in order to maximize the investment that they have in this important program. We've structured our webinar into four distinct parts. So we'll start with an overview of what sales compensation is and why it's important, the structure of the program, the levers at your disposal to, to drive those behaviors, and finally communicating the plan. Because after all, if reps don't understand their plans, then the comp program won't work. So simply put, sales compensation is an enablement program that rewards reps for driving behaviors in alignment with company goals. And there are a lot of different components that go into the comp plan, and we'll cover each one of these in detail later in the webinar. But the key is that each one of these components contributes to making the program, and ultimately your reps follow through on the behaviors required to support your customers. Driving those behaviors is consequently the number one benefit of the compensation program. Reps have skin in the game and are incentivized to go through the right sales motions that bring your customer strategy to life. And this means that you're providing your sales team not just the personal incentives to be successful, but also the glue that allows your overall coverage model to work together and provide the best customer experience possible. Finally, while you're rewarding and retaining the best talent, you're also able to financially protect the business by ensuring that you're paying reps only for the performance that you want. However, sales compensation programs are complex and can quickly become unwieldy, but with the right approach, we'll see that we can control them and not vice versa. The first component of the compensation program that we'll discuss today is pay level benchmarking, which are the rates at which companies will benchmark compensation targets to attract and retain the right talent in accordance with their allocated comp budgets. The, and there are four considerations we think about around pay levels. The first one is, what's the role that I'm hiring for? Each role is gonna have its own separate costs in the market, and, and that's gonna be the starting point to figure out how much we need to benchmark. The second consideration is, is what's my compensation budget and what can I afford? At the end of the day, we're trying to build a company and we can't break the bank, so we're, we're hamstrung a little bit by, by what the company can afford. The third is, what level of talent do I want to attract and retain? different resources, different valued resources come with different costs. And I like to think of this as, as if you're buying a car. The premium is like buying a Tesla. It, it is it's a great, great car. It's got all the bells and whistles. It's super shiny, but it's also really expensive. Maybe you don't need that for your business. Maybe you do. Right? Sometimes market rate driving a Ford is just fine too. It's, it's going to get the job done. It's going to be economical. It's going to last a long time. That's great. And sometimes I just need a Kia. I just need four wheels that's going to get me from point A to point B. At the end of the day, it's really up to what your business can afford and the type of talent that you're looking for. 
And the, the fourth consideration is, who am I competing for with this talent? You're going to need to put, put money behind attracting the, the right sales talent from different companies. So if you're in the ad tech space, for example, you're competing with the likes of Facebook and Google. And those guys are benchmarking pay at the 90th percentile of the market. So it's a philosophical conversation of, do we want to be paying the premium for that talent? Or do, is it okay for us to go after different roles? Um, because uh, at the end of the day, pay levels are about what you can afford and what works for your business. Um, and this is ultimately the biggest driver in terms of costs associated with your comp plan. Our next sales compensation component is often overlooked, uh, but it's called pay philosophy. And it's the management decision that differentiates earnings among our high and low performers to instill a desired culture among the sales team. So companies will use this uh, as a lever to drive the desired culture. Um, and also can use the compensation program to manage out poor, poor, poor performers. So there's a couple of different paid philosophies that we'll talk about. There are more, but these are the three main ones. The first one is, is an egalitarian pay philosophy. So we're not differentiating very much between our high and low performers and, and it promotes an everybody wins culture. You'll see this at a company like Boeing where you have uh, really large deals that take multiple years. And if you try to manage the reps on, on an annual basis with a compensation program, you would significantly differentiate earnings between people who are closing deals and people who are not. So Boeing tries to spread the wealth and say, let's, let's promote this egalitarian pay philosophy so we're all on the same team. The second philosophy is competitive. And we recommend this for most companies because it differentiates between high and low earners and fosters a, a, a healthy culture of competition without making people starve. Um, and the, the third component is the Darwinian philosophy or sell or die, sometimes also known as the Oracle model, uh, which significantly rewards high performers while using the compensation program uh, to manage out poor performers. Oracle is, is well known for this. When you talk to people who are uh, who work there, you'll see that if you do really well, you can make a lot of money. Um, but if you don't, there's you kind of get managed out and you have to go find another job. Um, for the people on, on the webinar today, I tell, pe I tell people not to skip out on this conversation and make your sales leaders own that strategic decision around your pay philosophy. Because strategically leveraging your pay philosophy can help manage reps and drive behaviors but it can also lead to churn. So make sure your revenue leaders are aware of this and they're buying into the culture that they want to drive with their comp plan. Moving on, we're next gonna talk about plan eligibility, which is the determination of the roles that should be governed by the sales compensation program. And there's two principles that we talk about for eligibility. The first one is, does this role have significant customer contact? Are they actually spending meaningful time in the customer and developing that relationship? The second principle is, does this role play a substantive role in influencing the sales process or customer behaviors. Because at the end of the day, with our sales compensation program, we wanna be paying for effective customer persuasion. So in this example, um, we have uh, a couple of different roles. The first one is a, a run-of-the-mill engineer. They're working on with product managers to define and create new offerings. They don't talk to customers. They don't have any influence in the end customer deal. So that's probably not a good use of our incentive dollars. The next role is a business development rep, your SDR. They're qualifying leads and they're setting appointments for, for sales reps. So they're talking to customers. They have a little bit of influence in the deal. So that's, that's a good use of our, of our incentive dollars. And then finally, we have the account executive. They're meeting with customers. They're building those relationships. They're scoping deals. They, they're talking to customers. They have a lot of influence in the deal. So that's definitely a good use of our, of our incentive dollars. Uh, one thing that I tell my clients about eligibility is that it's not always clear cut. Um, in some companies, for example, operations roles will play an incredibly important role in the sales and customer experience, like they're doing scoping and quoting. Um, and, they may, and they may actually be eligible for a sales plan because of the behaviors and the customer contact that they have. So just so don't assume that just because someone isn't in the sales department means that they don't belong on a, on a sales comp plan. Okay, on to Paymex, which is the second biggest driver of compensation costs, because it's the amount of someone's target cash compensation that's put at risk or is eligible for the upside in the plan. And there's, there's three principles we talk about for, for Paymex. The first one is that it's typically expected as, as a percentage of base salary versus bonus. So if I have a $100,000 target incentive, for example, um, and I have $60,000 base salary, $40,000 bonus, we call it a 60-40 plan. And the reason we do that is because it's easier for the reps to calculate in their heads, oh, here's how much money I, I wanna make overall, 
here's how much my base is versus what my bonus is. Some companies will, will use a, a percentage of base salary in order to calculate what that target incentive is. And that just adds to more to more math errors with your reps and can lead to a little bit of friction from the communications perspective. The second principle is that pay mix is tied to upside. So the more pay at risk, the more a participant should be able to earn in the program. It's kind of like going to Vegas. When you put a bunch of money in the pot, you know that you're putting it at risk, but that risk, should you perform well, should be paying off on the back end as well. And then finally, roles with more influence in the sales process and own the customer experience typically have more pay at risk. So in this example, the contract specialists who are responsible for doing the admin work is on the least aggressive pay mix at 90-10. And the account executive is on the most aggressive on that 50-50 plan. And we do this again because roles that have more influence in the sale should have more pay at risk and more skin in the game because they have more control over the deal. And, and as we'll see on the next slide, uh, we'll have more earnings upside. To keep your sanity in managing the comp program, I always recommend my, to my clients that we want to set pay mix by role and not by level. Meaning that account, account managers will always have the same pay mix regardless of whether they're level one, two, three, four, or five, whatever you have. And the reason we do this is because it makes promotions easier to manage and communicate while also creating that budgetary consistency that I'm, I'm sure finance is going to appreciate. So like we discussed on the last slide, uh, Paymix has an implication on the amount of upside or sometimes called leverage a rep can earn. And simply put, this is the amount of earnings you want your top performers to, to earn for performance. And so the three principles are an upside are number one, like we talked about before, um, upside is a company as a function of company affordability and market rates for specific roles. You might go out and see that account executives are on a three X plan, but your company can only afford a two and a half or a two X plan. That's okay. At the end of the day, we want to try to stay within the benchmark of, of what um, the market is paying. But if your company can't afford it, don't force it. The second principle is that, like we talked about, more pay at risk means more upside potential for high performers. Um, and then the third one is that although any rep can earn a, a full upside, uh, that, that full upside is reserved for the top 10% of performance at what we call the excellence point. And that's the, the, the quota performance point that we use in order to, to calculate what our compensation costs will be based on the distribution of, um, of performance. And the reason we have that excellence point and we, we calculate it out because we want to actually point to a rep every year that says, look at this person who made that full upside or more. It's what keeps the compensation program healthy and keeps reps uh, coming back and excited about the plan. Um, and so speaking of that, that compensation modeling, um, and I can't stress this enough, if you have a sales team of more than 20 people, you have to be modeling out your comp plan because more often than not, we're not just asking people to, to acquire new customers and grow the business, it's to grow in the right way without breaking the bank. So dust up those Excel skills, go put the model together and try to run a couple of pay scenarios to figure out under different company performance scenarios, how much is this compensation program going to cost you? Okay, moving on to measures. Um, these are the components of the compensation plan that define the key selling behaviors for which reps are rewarded. So this starts to bring the comp plan to life for your reps because you're telling them exactly what you want them to do. The first thing we talk about with measures is plans should include no more than three performance measures to ensure we have clear objectives. We can only think about so many things at one point in time. So let's make sure that we say, look, sales rep, I'm asking you to do A, B, and C this year. That's it. You can run a SPIF program. You can run these kind of on top pro bonus programs within the year to change behavior slightly, but overall, let, we don't want to overcomplicate the message. Let's, let's keep it as simple as we can. The second uh, principle is that each measure should be weighted at least 20% of the rep's target incentive to drive focus. And the reason we say that that measure should be weighted that, that amount is because you don't want reps to ignore a measure because they think they can make up their comp plan by overachieving in another measure. So for example, if you have a $50,000 target incentive with a measure that's weighted at 10%, then you're only incentivizing $5,000, which is an amount that a rep can conceivably make up with, with extra focus on the other $45,000 in incentive. It's a lot harder though, when you have a $10,000 bonus and you have to make it up on $40,000. And finally, the third measure is that measures should be derived from company goals to show how rep achievement contributes to goal realization. 
reps are arguably are on the front lines of, of your company. They're talking to customers and in sales can be a very difficult job with, with a lot of rejection. So we want to show that there's a direct connection between what the company is trying to do and where it's trying to go and the measures in the plan. So reps can feel that alignment, feel like they're contributing to the overall goal. Uh, and the key to, to measures is to think about them, not just in terms of, of one specific role, uh, but in terms of the entire coverage model. Because after all, one rep doesn't actually own the entire customer experience. And you want to make sure that all of your customer facing roles are incentivized in the same direction to work together to deliver a great customer experience. The last two slides around plan design itself are going to be focused on the nitty gritty of the plan. And they're not the most exciting components, but it's really important that we get these right. And we'll start by talking about mechanics, uh, which are the compensation structures that govern the administration of the plan measures. So in this slide, we've laid out six of the most common mechanics that you should be familiar with when designing your comp plan. The first one is a commission rate, where reps earn a fixed percentage of a bonus based on the total production value. So they get 5% of everything that they sell. These are really great for, for managing a small team and when you want to keep the administration work for your plan down. But if you start adding more roles to your coverage model, you'll quickly realize that your compensation plans um, uh, don't necessarily help manage costs. The next me uh, mechanic is called an ICR, or an individual commission rate, where each rep is given a unique commission rate based on their target incentive and their quota. So they'll get, if you have a, um, a $50,000 target incentive and a million dollar quota, that's your 5% your individual commission rate. Personally, I try not to use ICRs when possible because they can be confusing for some reps and they can lengthen the sales readiness timeline because each rep has to have their own commission rate calculated for every measure before communication. And that's a lot of work depending upon the size of your sales organization. They do work well, however, when companies want to move to a quota-based bonus program from a commission structure because they sit nicely between the commissions and quotas by giving reps a commission rate that helps them understand how much money they can make but also get some thinking about how do I manage my, myself and my time against uh, the, the quota that, that I'm assigned. The third mechanic is quotas. You give them a target, they, get, they make a certain amount of money based on the performance against that quota. These are the gold standards for most comp programs. And what we tell people is basically, if your company has the ability to set quota and do it accurately, then this is the, the mechanic that we want to use. Step bonuses um, are, are extremely rare. Right, the, the pay curve looks like a bunch of steps, if you can imagine that, um, where the reps stay at the same incentive amount until achieving the next level of performance. And although these aren't always the best mechanics, they can be good to use when you have a lumpy business and you always want your reps thinking about the, the next outcome and the next goal. Next, we have unit rate measures um, that pay a flat amount of money for performance. So you'll see this frequently in an SDR plan where they receive 50 bucks for every appointment set. It's simple, it's cost effective, but it doesn't really differentiate earnings by target incentive amount. Um, meaning that if I have a rep that is making $100,000 in bonus and a rep that's making $80,000 in bonus, paying that, that flat rate is, is going to make one person hit their target incentive faster than the other. Um, so we try to use this, this mechanic for, um, for roles that have a similar incentive amount um, so that there's not a, a, an unfair for, uh, perception or perspective from the reps. Um, and lastly, we have KSOs and MBOs, or key sales objectives and management by objectives. These are really great mechanics when the measure is hard to quantify. So I've seen this used for, for like market development folks, for example, where they have to go and do things that increase brand awareness. Um, and instead of commissioning like an expensive study on brand lift, companies will just create a rubric of activities and then the managers will be able to define the performance level for their reps, and then there's a corresponding amount that the rep can actually get paid. Um, you don't see these very often um, because they're, they're very subjective and require manager input, but they can be really good to have in the back pocket if there's some things that are hard to quantify that you want to measure the reps on. At the end of the day, it, it's up to you and your sales team to determine the right me mechanics for your business, but, but by following our guide, we hope you'll be able to manage your comp costs and drive the right behaviors among your reps. The, the last topic we'll discuss around plan design is crediting. Uh, and these are the rules that determine how reps retire quota against the mechanics in their plans. So we've called out uh, five of the most common crediting rules for, for SaaS companies. The first one is, is revenue, where reps get paid on whatever finance says they recognize as revenue. 
Another one is called total contract value. So it's the reps are given credit for the complete length of the contract that's signed, regardless of the term length. Um, another variation of that is the annual contract value, which is either the, the value of the first year of that contract, or sometimes it's the average uh, of the, the total contract value. Um, and then we move into the recurring revenue. So ARR or annual recurring revenue is the annual value of all the active contracts in someone's portfolio. And then MRR is related to that. It's just shortened to, a, to the monthly spend. The reason why you would differentiate between these different crediting rules is around line of sight. If I have a rep who's focused on long-term relationships, long-term sales and behaviors, I want to be thinking more towards TCV or ACV because I want them thinking about something that's more holistic than the day-to-day -day experience. When you have a, a product that does consumption, for example, and it's really important that the rep or the customer has a great experience, we start thinking about measuring against ARR and MRR because we want people focused on the day-to-day -day minutia that is going to really make a difference in, in that customer experience and increase their spend. The second big component we talked about with crediting is around uh, the different crediting types. So there is there's vertical crediting, which is thinking about how do my, my managers get credit for what my reps do? Oftentimes you'll see managers inherit the credit from their sales reps, but sometimes there's a break point where VPs get paid on something slightly different than, than their first line managers. And that's, that's okay. The point is, how do we wanna make sure that we are incentivizing the right management chain uh, and, and making sure that we are, we're having our managers support the right strategy and behaviors on our reps? The second type of crediting is called horizontal crediting which is how reps or different functions will share credit for deals. You'll hear this as like a cross GU or a BU split credit sync crediting policy, but it's also how your sales engineers can get, get credit for the work that they do. And you want to align those, those crediting rules across your sales organization because like we talked about earlier in the webinar, it's the glue that sticks the reps together and keeps them aligned, keeps them aligned towards supporting your customers as opposed to fighting each other for credit. Remember that these are people who put pay at risk and they signed up and said, I'm willing to, to take a pay cut if I don't perform. So if, if they're spending a lot of time fighting each other for credit, um, then they're actually spending less time in front of the customer. So think about how you want to get your reps to, to work together and have that, that nice horizontal crediting policy. So that concludes our conversation around plan design itself, but there's two final components that we'll want to talk about around the design process and plan communication as well. So many times when I work with clients, they'll ask me, all right, so you're here doing this work, but what process should we follow to make this successful on our own? And there's really no right answer, but I've called out a few approaches that work based on um, how many primary quota here that your, your organization has. So for small companies, less than 30 primary quota carriers, you, it's often a very fast design process, right? Your, your, uh, your CEO and your CRO, COO will get together, say, this is what I want the plan to look like, this seems good, great and then they roll out the plan. It's quick, it's simple, it takes a, a very short period of time. As your company starts to grow and there are more functions that, that mature and evolve, what you'll see is uh, the design team comes to the more like VP leadership level and they're focused on running analytics, talking about what the plan should look like, interpreting sales strategy and behaviors, and then creating proposals so that it can be approved by the C-suite. Because you have more reps, that process will take a little bit longer, one, one to three weeks, um, but still it's pretty fast. And then finally, for my larger companies where you have over 100 primary quota carriers, um, that design team gets, gets lowered to another level. People who are the leads, they're focused on, I'm thinking about running more analytics, talking about how different functions should be working together. And it's a little bit more, um, a little more in depth from a design perspective. So that's why we, we want to get the uh, the plan design folks closer to the actual reps. They will then have a proposal that gets elevated to that, that VP level. Um, and then oftentimes there's some costing that goes, goes with it that then will uh, be sent up to the CFO for final approval. And because we have all of these different roles to manage that that process will take three to seven weeks or even longer. I have, I've had comp plan design projects that have gone months, months at a time. Um, just again, depending upon how big your sales organization is. Um, but the, the biggest piece of advice that I have for, for companies, especially in the 30 plus primary quota period range, is to run analytics on plan performance and results and costs because compensation is an inherently emotional piece of every company's go-to-market strategy. 
Um, but having the data to back up any design decisions or changes, it will help make communications easier and, and kind of lower the reactivity of the reps. So finally, uh, we're going to talk about plan communication. Um, and by this point in the design process, and probably this webinar as well, uh, fatigue is, is going to start to sink in, and, and that happens. But don't use that as an excuse not to focus on sales communications because this is the final mile of the marathon and it can truly make or break your comp plan. So every year, there's, there's three things that we need to think about from a communication perspective. The first one is, is the plan documents, which is the, the, the material that tells the reps, here's my measure, here's how the plan works, the crediting policies, and connecting that back to the sales strategy. This is the first piece of sales enablement that the rep actually will look at every year. So we want to make sure we get the messaging right on those documents. The next component is around the terms and conditions. And, and with our T's and C's, it's, it's all of the, the legalese, it's the policies that govern the overall program, things like um, how do I manage territory transfers or uh, what's my ramping program look like. It's the components that not every rep needs to read, but you need to have in place to protect your business financially um, and legally. So we try to separate those, but deliver them uh, with the, the plan documents so the reps have all of their communications in one place. And then finally, we have the communication decks. Um, you, we wanna be motivating our reps and getting them excited for the new, the new fiscal year. So we wanna have an opportunity for our sales leadership to get in front of the team, celebrate the wins from last year, talk about what's gonna happen next year, and make sure there's a connection between the sales strategy and the kind of um, measures that they're gonna, the reps are gonna see in the comp plan. On top of that, we also wanna arm our sales managers with the information that they need in order to effectively communicate the plan to, to reps, right? Reps can have a hard time understanding what's actually in the plan doc and all the messaging. It's, it's confusing at the beginning of the year. So we wanna make sure that the people who are closest to them have the information they need to, to be successful. So uh, with that, I wanted to, to thank everyone for, for sticking with us through all the content. I, I know there was a lot, but I'm hoping that you found it informative. So with that, uh, Erica, I will send it back to you. Wow, thank you so much, Matt, for that um, wealth of information. Um, it looks like we have a few questions that have rolled in, and I'll start with the first question from Tom Healy. He said, what are some best practices on when to loop in the different set of stakeholders? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And like, like we were talking about on the plan design slide, um, at the end of the day, there's always going to be a group of people that have to approve your plans. And when I do plan design work, I try to loop in my, my key stakeholders like, bi-weekly. So every couple of weeks, I want to either have a 30-minute meeting or send an email and just say, hey, here's where things are landing. So we're giving them an opportunity to have feedback, um, but also they, they also want to make sure that we're on the right track. So um, I think every, every couple of weeks is probably a good cadence to keep them uh, updated on, on how plan design is coming along. Okay, and it looks like we have one more question from Greb Ratray. He said, how involved should finance be in this process? Yeah, um, finance, in, I think that depends on the culture of your company. Um, in some organizations, finance really drives a lot of the, the, the budgeting and the costing. So if, if you have kind of like a type A sales finance organization, um, we want to keep them involved in the process. They might even help with some of the design measures. Um, but other than that, um, I think that what they're concerned about is, is really what's this going to cost the business. So keep them in the loop um, and, and show them that you're going through that plan costing information so that they can have some kind of a forecast into how much they can expect the plan to cost throughout the course of the year. Okay, and we have one last question from Grace Middlestead. She says, how do you prevent gaming the system? That, that is an awesome question, Grace, and one that I think every, every design session kicks off with, how to prevent my reps from gaming the system. And the reality is that you can't prevent them from gaming your comp plan in every way, shape, and form. But what you can do is try to think forward how can I get them to game it in a way that, that is beneficial to my business, right? Because 
if I need, I need to show my reps a path to, to doing what I need them to do. Um, but I know that people are going to try to find the, the wiggle room. So think about put your, put your shoes, uh, put yourself in the shoes of a rep as you're going through the plan design process and think, how, how can I actually make more money by doing the wrong behaviors? Including sales managers in your, in your plan design process is another really good way to do that because they're measured on the overall success of the business, not whether the rep gets paid or not. So having them try to think about, hey, if you're a rep, how would you mess with this plan can be really beneficial to make sure that the constructs you're putting together are going to uh, protect the business and not cost you exorbitantly for the wrong behaviors. Great. Well, um, that about wraps up our webinar here on sales compensation, everything your company needs to know. Um, Matt Holler, I want to thank you once again for um, giving us so much to work with and so much information that our sales ops professionals can hopefully employ um, in their sales operations departments. Um, so if anyone has any questions or if you guys need to reach out to us um, for anything regarding sales ops, um, our information is listed here on the final slide. Um, other than that, um, everyone have a great day and hopefully we'll be in touch.